Hello, and welcome to another edition of Sree's Sunday New York Times Read Along. We're back after taking a break for Memorial Day weekend. Our guest today is Jesse Pesta, deputy editor of the New York Times Climate Desk. He's also a former South Asian correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. Our host, of course, is Sri Srinivasan. We're live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and our Digimenters website. Please like, please comment, please share. My name is Neil Parekh. I'm the executive producer and occasional guest host of the show. We have a lot of great things planned for you today. We'll be taking a look at uh, some recent features from the New York Times Climate Desk. Uh, they are digital first, so we'll be focusing on the online treatment, but of course, we're not gonna forget about print. We also have PDFs of the print uh, stories, courtesy of the New York Times. Uh, so we'll walk through that uh, with Jesse. He'll talk us about talk us through the digital version, and then we'll review the print version together. Um, please let us know where you're watching from. Uh, tag your friends, uh, share, uh, we'll uh, do our welcomes. Uh, and then we'll also bring Jesse on early uh, so that we can uh, start talking with him and go through the paper like we usually do. Um, so first, I want to give a big shout out to Jonathan for watching from the East Village. Jonathan, always great to, to see you. And uh, we have uh, Patricia Freudenberg watching from New York as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Patricia. Uh, Patricia's watching on LinkedIn. And we have uh, David uh, uh, Savage, uh, yes, blessings and thank you. Love this. Cheers uh, from David. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I don't remember seeing your name before, so maybe you're a longtime watcher, first time commenter. Uh, I have to say thank you to Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar. So I'm going to take a personal moment, Sri, if you don't mind. Um, folks know that, uh, if some folks might know that um, over the last uh, two weeks, I actually had a uh, scheduled minor uh, ear surgery, inner ear surgery. Um, and this is my first week kind of getting back to things, but I can't tell you how helpful Sujana has been in that process, talking to my doctor here in Virginia. And um, uh, I'm doing fairly well uh, with the recovery. So thank you uh, so much. We have uh, James uh, Keith watching, first time watcher on LinkedIn from Harlem, New York. Uh, and Ken Fisher watching from Iowa. Uh, Ken, always great uh, to see you. Again, we are live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and our Digimenters website. Uh, we certainly want you to um, uh, share uh, this with people. And I just realized I had the wrong banner up. My apologies uh, to Jesse. Um, but uh, uh, we will uh, bring him on shortly. I'm going to bring on Sri uh, as well. Uh, Sri, great to see you. Uh, that's not your usual background. Uh, what's, what's going on there? No, it's not. Uh, not usual at all. I am in Salt Air on Fire Island. This is a small village on Fire Island, which is one of the barrier islands off Long Island. It's about 90 minutes from Manhattan, and it's a different world, uh, but also a different world where you can be in a log cabin like this. And uh, we are so excited for our chat with Jesse Pesta. Folks, he's the deputy climate editor of the New York Times. Uh, we have so much to talk about. This particular place is ground zero for climate change. And uh, we're gonna be able to talk about that. Uh, we wanna thank our sponsors, the folks at Muckrack, uh, our wonderful friends there, Mike Schneider, uh, Lee Semmel, and Greg Gallant. Uh, if you'd like to be a sponsor of this show, please email us, sri at digimentors.group or neil at digimentors.group. And this show is brought to you by our company, Digimentors. We do digital marketing, events and digital programs, strategic, uh, strategic communications, training, staffing. And speaking of training, I've started to do my first set of AI workshops uh, explaining what I call my non-scary guide to AI. So if you have a lunch and learn or a conference or anything at which you would like me to come and talk to you about AI, we can do 20 minutes or three hours. And 
we can do it at any price you like, including zero dollars, because this is so important at the moment for all of us to understand this. So get in touch with me, email me if you'd like to have me do something remote or in person. No audience is too small or too big. And Neil, just want to say I'm so glad you're okay after that uh, inner ear surgery. Thank you. And uh, we're psyched to have Jesse with us. Absolutely. Before we jump in, though, with Jesse, uh, I want folks to understand how much Sri, uh, his dedication to the show, what he went through to bring you the New York Times this morning. Let's watch this this video. Uh, this is Sri. Bring the Viking New York home. Times for the Sunday New York Times read along. This is the village of Saltaire. Lovely homes on Fire Island. Now, I got this video Let's about the post. 8 15, wondering whether Sri was going to make Hi, it home in time. <laughs> Talk soon. See you on the Sunday New York Times read along, 8 30 to 10 a.m. Eastern, Sundays, as we read the Sunday New York Times out loud on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, and on the Digimentors website, digimentors.group. Thanks. Bye. He did All that right. while biking. <laughs> I do it while sitting here, but you know, this is uh thank you. <laughs> and Sajina says she loves the bike ride video. Yeah, folks, uh, tell your friends, uh, tag them right now. Anyone who's interested in journalism, in the importance of uh, fighting misinformation, disinformation, and of course today climate change, because we're the deputy editor of New York Times Climate with us. Please tell them to watch. They can watch it live or later, and it'll run on all these channels right away as soon as it's, we're off the air. We have people who are watching all the way in California and people watching all over Asia as well. And there's Sujana saying she loves the, the bike ride video. Stefan, uh, he's part of the New York Times Read Along family, and of course, the Digimentors family as well. And Patricia says, amazing diligence. Uh, hey, my executive producer uh, runs a tight ship. So I think we're ready to go. Look at Absolutely. all the hooks they have here, Neil. That's pretty unusual, right? This is a bedroom, and they have all the hooks for towels and things there. And there's another one across the wall. So we're all hooked up here, as they Something. say. So why don't we go ahead and bring uh, Jesse on uh, and you can get, um, we can start talking with him and we'll take a look at the paper. One of the things we've been doing recently is talking to our guest a little bit first uh, and then jumping in uh, to the paper. So let's bring on. And I'll just show people that sure. yeah, there is that horrific train crash in, uh, in the state of Odisha in Eastern India. Uh, that's on the front page of the New York Times and uh, one of the top stories, near, nearly 300 in three-way crash of India trains. Absolutely. Uh, again, Jesse Pesta is the deputy editor of the New York Times Climate Desk. He's also the former South Asia correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. It is our pleasure to have Jesse Pesta, also known as the brother of former New York Times read-along guest, Abigail Pesta. Jesse, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much. It's, it's fantastic to see you both. Uh, Sri, it's been a long time. <laughs> um, I'm actually doing this from, uh, you said you're, you're calling in from a village off the coast of, uh, of the United States of America, somewhere over there. I'm also doing this from a village off the coast of Manhattan, I guess, also known as Brooklyn. <laughs> so, not quite as many trees here. Yeah, but I, I see you got the bicycle and uh, the lovely carpets. So exactly, we uh, do yeah, have the bike. You have to tell us about the uh, f photographs in the back. They black and white, very nice. The wall yeah. behind you, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So go ahead, Sri. I'll, I'll leave the show uh, to you. All right, thank you, Neil, and welcome everybody. And this is Jesse Pesta. We're so happy to have him with us. Are you a morning person? That's the first thing I have to ask. Are you a Sunday oh. morning? early person I, I i really am i'm usually up by around 6 or 6 30 so uh strange but true i've been up for a while yeah. okay not many people are uh you have uh, of course you're on twitter at jesse pesta and your website is jessepesta.com and since we did already mention your sister let's do a shout out to her she joined us when she was doing her investigative work around the uh, horrible uh, uh a sexual abuse situation yeah. at Michigan State. You can tell us a little bit about Abby too. Yeah, well, she's a fantastic sister. Uh, so let's just get that out there. Um, she is, um, uh, 
she's done many, many things over the course of her career, but she is a journalist as well. She, uh, uh, the book you're speaking about is called uh, The Girls, and it was this really amazing reconstruction of really a quarter century of the abuse uh, that was occurring uh, around Nasser and some of the some of the people associated with him. Uh, going all the way back, she even found uh, the very the, the person who was most likely the very uh, very first victim. Really, an, an astonishing book. Um, anyway, uh, more recently, just a couple of what a week or so ago, she had a big piece in Rolling Stone. Um, uh, another just absolutely astonishing story of a young woman who had been arrested for uh, shoplifting, basically in in uh, rural America ended up in jail for this and uh, then essentially was mysteriously poisoned and died. And the uh, essentially the, the, the lack of ramifications for this tragedy, uh, really amazing story. That was just a couple, that was just a week or so ago in Rolling Stone. Well, that's, uh, she's such a good reporter and she's such a great storyteller, not just in book form, but also when she joined us on the read along and it's uh, really nice that uh, she'll be joining us today, I'm sure, and she listening. Said, yeah. She said she was going to listen, so I imagine we'll see her name pop up. Uh, Abby's not a morning person. so <laughs> She, got she came up. to my home, you know, she to do my show. She had to come. In those days, we were oh. still doing it in person. So she came to my apartment in on the Upper West Side. And, uh, and uh, this is the story you were describing. A young mom was arrested for theft and died mysteriously in jail. And there's her name, Abigail Pesta. And folks, check out her book as well, The Girls. And through her, we met the judge on the uh, on the Nasser trial, Judge uh, Rosemary Aquilina, and she was a guest on our show. So uh, the, the connections are so wonderful. So Jesse, we already have a nice comment. I think someone's noticing how bright and uh, sunshiny you are. It says, uh, <laughs> thank you for bringing sunshine to LinkedIn Live, uh, because I presume most of the other episodes are not like that. And here's Monica. Good morning from New York City. Uh, welcome, Monica. Tell your friends, tag them. We're talking to the deputy editor of New York Times Climate. So let's start with that. What is the what is New York Times Climate? How long have you been there? Talk about that. Sure. Um, so uh, that, that's, the New York Times Climate Desk is pretty much what it sounds like. It's uh, a, a desk, a staff of reporters and editors at the New York Times, and we focus on, on climate and environment coverage. And um, uh, we uh, um, write and report all sorts of stories, whether it is uh, breaking news, like earlier this week, we had that astonishing news about um, Phoenix. The city of Phoenix is no longer going to uh, allow how, uh, new homes to be built in significant chunks of the city because the city is running out of water. So we have that kind of breaking news uh, type of coverage. We do um, uh, features, um, uh, investigative work. We'll see some of that a little bit later. I think I think you have a few pieces teed up that we can sort yes, of look. We do. For. Yeah. Um, we do explanatory journalism. Uh, we build uh, interactive games. Isn't quite the right word, but uh, interactive features where you, you can sort of uh, you're you're tested to see if you can figure out the right answer to various questions. Um, I don't think I shared a link a link of, for that with you earlier, but I can send one along. Um, we are digital first desk, which sounds awfully jargony and sort of. Uh, abstruse, but what that means is we do all of our work with a view to publishing it online uh, primarily, and then the work is adapted for uh, the print newspaper, the print presentation. Um, so we're a sort of a forward, uh, forward-looking uh, desk in that respect as well. Although, of course, many other desks at the Times obviously do that now as too. So that's kind of. That's kind of what I'm. I'm the deputy editor, but it's not a big. It's not a big group, so it basically means I'm an editor in the group, and I do a lot of stuff. How about that? <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Uh, tell us about the uh, uh, recent announcement. I saw uh, you and your colleagues had announced about uh, Somini Sengupta, who we all know so well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Somini is just. She. I'm. I happen. To, I happen to be her editor, um, and I mean, we just love Somini. Um, she did such fantastic work with the newsletter over the past e a year or so. And, uh, you know, there's the Climate Forward newsletter. 
which is published twice a week. And she has been the lead writer of that newsletter now for a year or more. I don't remember exactly how long, but uh, she basically led this really uh, significant rethink of how we uh, do the newsletter and just has been writing terrific um, uh, personal essays, reported pieces, just, 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 she's just fantastic. And uh, doing that with uh, um, Manuela Andrioni, her co-writer. Anyway, Sumini is now moving on to a kind of a more expanded role where she'll be doing sort of global features on climate um, uh, in enterprise reporting and also analytical writing. And she's going to start that in a couple of months. Uh, she has a leave uh, here for a little while and then she'll be coming back and doing, doing this new job. Well, it's such an important, um, important job. One thing that wasn't clear to us who are you know, uh, lay people, even those of us obsessed with the times, as we can see with the read along, uh, we weren't clear. And this was probably before your time. Do you remember when there was kind of the in, what we understood outside is that they were dissolved the climate desk? Like I'm talking about like a decade ago. Do you oh. remember this? What yeah. was all that about? And we didn't we didn't quite understand. So maybe you can explain that. Yeah, that was before my time. So I, I literally didn't work at The New York Times mm -hmm. when that happened. So I don't know. I, mean, I can't. I can't dish some kind of backstory. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm generally familiar um, uh, with what happened. I think that was a period of time when the Times was moving away from uh, the the notion of these uh, semi-independent blog-like publications. Uh, so I think that perhaps played a role. But I don't. I. I Truly, I just don't know. So what happened then is the Times, though, did continue, continue to cover climate, of course. Um, and uh, But it tried different methods in the newsroom. Um, there was a period of time, now this I, I was present for, where the desks, uh, all of the desks, oh, there's Samini, yeah. Um, it, all of the desks around the newsroom, business, metro, et cetera, would um, meet regularly and there would be like one uh, editor from each desk who was in charge of sort of a climate related coordination across the various desks. Anyway, that sounds very bureaucratic and it was probably not the most efficient system, but I happened to be the climate envoy from the business desk at that time. So there was a period of time when that was tried. And then this desk, it was decided to build the desk that we now have uh, here. Uh, Excellent. Right work. And a yeah. shout out to Hannah Fairfield, your colleague. And uh, Hannah is my boss. Yes. She, and Hannah is just, you know, um, I mean, she's my boss. So I, you could say, of course, Jesse would say this, but it also has the advantage of being true. Hannah is just absolutely fantastic. Um, so please follow her as well. She's H Fairfield on Twitter and, and, and a terrific journalist. One of the great things about Hannah is that she comes from the visual side of the newsroom. So there's just a lot to learn, a lot to learn. She's really she's she's really something yeah all right and i'm going to extend an invitation to her to join us in the months ahead as well and uh, i'm just going to pull up some of the comments that have come in here including one abby pesta who says uh Sri and jesse thanks for all the kind comments our dear friend ron thomas who's been a guest on the show multiple times he also came to my home and had breakfast and read the paper together he's in dubai and he it travels the world but always tunes in naomi service says Climate coverage is the most important beat in today's world. I say that all the time, Jesse. What do you feel like an extra burden or uh, opportunity or do you welcome it? How does it feel to be part of the climate desk? Um, it's, uh, you know, very, very satisfying. Um, it is an important story. Um, there... Um, I mean, really, it boils down to that. Um, I wouldn't say I feel a particular burden or uh, or weight other than just the usual one when you're a journalist, which is you just want to be absolutely sure that you're getting it right or as right as possible. That's I've I've felt that stress and strain in many of my jobs over the years and decades at newspapers, including in South Asia, but also any number of other, you know, roles. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's the same, but a little different because it is, you know, I agree that it is um, the most important story, really, the, the most important story. And it's, it's an economic story. It's a social story. It's a geopolitical story. It's a tech story. It's all of, 
it's every story. Yeah, every story. And that's what it is. And we have a friend named Sweta Chakraborty who runs an organization, the US branch of it, and it's called We Don't Have Time. That just it's an anti, you know, uh, climate change or um, alleviating climate change as much as possible. And I love that name. We don't have time. So speaking of time, we've got to get to the little bit of the paper and then we'll come back, talk to Jesse about his work as well as uh, his career. He got to cover the 9-11 attacks and the aftermath of them in South Asia. So we'll hear about that, too. Please tag your friends right now and tell them that we do this every Sunday, 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. And here we're looking at the front page of the paper, uh, the st stunning picture about of the attack, uh, sorry, the uh, crash on uh, Saturday uh, of the train collision that killed at least 288 people and injured more than 700 in the state of Odisha, known previously as Orissa. And uh, this is unfortunately, uh, as you know, Jesse, uh, a site in many developing countries with infrastructure and other issues. I haven't followed what was the exact reason for this, but we know it was just horrible. Yeah, I um, all I know is what I've been reading in the newspaper. It sounds like, um, and this may have changed since I was in the past few hours, because obviously it's a breaking news story, but it sounded like perhaps there was a freight train that was stopped on the tracks and the one of these passenger trains was unaware that it had stopped in its path and just barreled right into it. And then the other train going the other direction, I guess, or on another track, then hit some of the derailed cars. Something like that was, mm -hmm. the, was the latest version of events as of several hours ago. And what was especially disturbing, some of you may have seen this video of how they were moving the bodies in, in at least one video, you could see the bodies were kind of just being lifted and thrown onto a truck, the dead bodies. And that's no way to treat uh, victims of anything, uh, and certainly not an accident. Uh, and it was very sad to see. So we'll we'll be tracking the story and see what happens. Tells you the importance, right? Uh, in even in today's digital world, Jesse, the front page of the New York Times sets the news agenda in some ways. It uh, tells you these are the things the editors think are important. The lead story is here in state houses. New laws show a deeper divide, single party control, leaning into cultural issues and bulldozing the opposition. This makes it sound like it's an equal problem, but of course it's not. Relying on those who know the Arctic best, lessons from the Inuit for Canada's defense of the territory. So I thought this would be a climate change story. Maybe it is in part, but uh, this was not from your desk, was it? No, it wasn't. In fact, that's one I uh, really want to read. I just haven't read it yet. Uh, so I don't know if it gets into uh, climate uh, climate issues or not. Uh, but yeah, that's I just think it's fascinating to be to be, uh, you know, I, I'm making assumptions here because I've not read the story, but waking up to the notion that we've got a lot to learn from the folks who have uh, made made a life in some of these places for generations. Right. Yeah. Meanwhile, a is for army. In Russia, war is part of class. Some of you won't know this, but I went to kindergarten in Russia in the old Soviet Union. I used to come home saying Lenin is God and play, uh, speak fluent Russian. And uh, we used to have black bread and cabbage soup every night, uh, every day, and mandatory sleep time for everybody. And I couldn't sleep then. And uh, But here, this is about how they use the classroom, just like the Soviet Union, uh, to for propaganda, and uh, I, I've lived through that, and that's why I found uh, the the name of Trump's company Truth Social to be hilarious because Pravda was is is Russian for truth, and we know it was a state uh, terrible state news agency. Uh, for women in Mauritania, divorce is cause for joy, not sorrow. That's uh, interesting. And here's a sun dog, a phenomenon the Intuit says a pred predictor of bad weather in the Rankin Inlet in Canada. So I guess that's the sun dog when the light comes like that. And spry diplomat with stiff gait, aging leader's complex reality. I guess there's also looking at his, uh, his aviators are part of this story. If anyone has read the Mauritania piece and can tell us what that's about, about what's happening there with divorce, uh, I would be interested in hearing that. We're just going to flip through the inside. Uh, there's a lot of lot going on with the the page A A two and A three. I know there's an A two A three editor that we've talked to, and 
so much going on here. Uh, our friend Tom Jolly, whose house we've been to, reading the paper, the print editor, they've really invested in this in this section. And you've got everything from Here to Help, four films to stream before they leave Netflix in June. Let me just tell you what they are. The Mist, How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, Puss in Boots, and The Taking of Pelham 123. This is a 1974 version, not the Denzel version. That, that one starred Jack Matha, uh, uh, um uh, what Matthau? God, I'm already. I'm, oh, it'll it'll say yeah. this here. I don't remember, but that's a classic. The old yeah. one. That's the yeah. only one I've seen, and it is a classic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Walter Matthau. How do I forget his Walter name? Matthau, yeah. uh, Jack Lemon, when Walter Matthau died, said that he had the face of an unmade bed, and he was his best friend from the uh, uh, all, all the ways they all, all the days of uh, the Odd Couple. How we write explainer articles explained. Oh. This sounds interesting, and you do a lot of explainers in climate section. So yes, uh, I don't know if you've that. seen this yet. No, but I'll have to read that. And <laughs> and uh, tracing one word through our report, the word stream. So they're looking at that, and then the dateline of journalists reporting around the world. Can you tell us uh, if you remember all the details or some of the details of this change in the bylines in the New York Times? Oh, you mean the recent thing where we're... Yeah, not uh, the bylines, the datelines. That's what they've changed, yeah. yeah. Yes, that's something that's... Um, that's an interesting switch, and I think it's... I just think it's a really good idea. I think people don't understand what a dateline is and what a dateline means. They see this blob of capital letters at the front of a story, and it's unclear what that really represents. So we've moved to this... Now, it hasn't happened in print yet. This is only online. But if you look at uh, many, most, perhaps at this point, all of our stories online, we've moved away from that that all capital letters, you know, uh, city name at the front of a story. And instead we'll have a sentence uh, describing uh, in a more conversational way what, where the reporter reported from or what they did. And the idea is just to help um, readers understand um, that reporters actually went to this place, right? Um, or, you know, actually uh, took some you know, hands-on steps to report a particular story. So those new things can take many, many forms. They can be as simple as, you know, by Jane Doe rep uh, reporting from Dubuque, right? Could be that simple. Or they can be a full sentence, you know, Jane Doe uh, traveled, to traveled to, you know, Arkansas, uh, rode on a horse and uh, ate a hot dog in the reporting of the story. Now, that's a silly example, but it can be more explicit about the steps that a reporter has taken as well. Oh, there you've got there the thing. Yeah. yeah. And this is the, this is the explanation yeah. of the, so they have the plain unadorned byline, a simple dateline, or a full enhanced byline. And they started online, and now they're going to move that, I presume, eventually to the print paper as well. I mean, a, a, a more accurate example would be, you know, uh, in the, Jesse Pesta reported from uh, New York and Annapolis, spoke to several dozen people, uh, you know, to, in the reporting of the story and reviewed, uh, you know, a few dozen documents that were uh, internal government documents. You know, that's that's the kind of structure that you'd look for so, so that we're telling readers at the front end, um, here's here's the work that went into the story. Well, that's that's really that's really important. And as you you know, I was talking a little bit about the Soviet Union, Jesse, sometimes it feels like for the rest of us who are trying to figure out what's going on at the times, there's a little bit of that criminal Kremlinology that happens. And uh, that's why we do the show so we can understand more. And here's an unusual, I'm going to spend a second on this ad. It's from Stony Brook University and Maury McInnes, who became president the semester really that I was leaving after three years, I had a visiting professorship named for the great Marshall Loeb, who was editor of Fortune and, uh, and uh, Money Magazine. And uh, Stony Brook has gotten a $500 million gift in endowment funds to uh, Stony Brook from the, si the Simons Foundation. And that's Jim and Marilyn uh, uh, Simons. And What's interesting is their first gift was seven hundred and fifty million, seven hundred fifty dollars in nineteen eighty three, and that's gone all the way to five hundred million dollars. Uh, 
One of our clients, Jesse, uh, had made a big donation of $50 million somewhere and couldn't get any traction in the uh, philanthropy press because that amount was too little. And what does that tell you about the world we live in, right? We, we, it, we finally got him some press, but it was so difficult. $50 million wasn't enough. And here it is, a $500 million gift. Uh, you went to a university with a big endowment and uh, and where they do a lot of fundraising. So I'm sure they hit you up as well, Jesse. Uh, tell us about your alma mater. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I went to Notre Dame and they do a remarkably good job of tracking people, I suppose, like every, every savvy university does. Um, but yeah, so I was, I mean, this is a long time ago. I have a little bit of trouble remembering. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I was at, ND, I, I um, studied uh, theater, basically, I wanted to be a cameraman, uh, you know, I, I wanted to be like a cinematographer, to use the fancy pants word, probably didn't pick the right school for that. Um, however, that's what I did. It was it was a, a, a fantastic place to go to school, uh, although the football team was terrible at that point. Um, but you've been back for football games and homecoming and all that stuff? Not, not in a long time. I did a few times immediate, immediately afterwards. I, was all, sure. I also worked at the public radio station there. Right. Um, uh, was the station manager of the FM, you know, FM classical music station, which was just tremendous fun. Tremendous fun. School is small enough that you you can do a thing like that, right? Yeah, I, uh, most of what I know from about Notre Dame comes from the movie Rudy. <laughs> and uh, and a little known fact uh, for most people is if you've seen that film, uh, of course, the main actor uh, in it, Sean Austin, went on to have a big career in the Lord of the Ring films. But uh, the boy, the, the, the man who plays his friend who goes to the school across the road, is it the College of St. Mary's, I think, uh, and is his tutor is actually John Favreau, the actor, the director of uh, all the Iron Man films. Oh, really? Oh, my God, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So well, same, he, same he's same like a comic relief. He's not. He's called Bebop or something in the film. And... St. Mary's is a girls' school, uh, mm -hmm. women's school across, uh, yeah. basically across the highway. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and Patricia says, uh, love the uh, philanthropy at its finest. Love the, that story, Sri. And Paula Kiger, longtime producer for us on the show, is watching from Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, hi, Paula. Thanks uh, for watching. And I notice your uh, pride uh, ring on your uh, on your display photo. So uh, thanks for doing that. And Mary C. Curtis is here. Such an important topic. Tuning in for a change from New York City here to teach a political commentary course at the School of the New York Times Summer Academy. Uh, Mary is a fantastic columnist and friend of the show. She's been on. She's a columnist for Roll Call and does her own podcast and all kinds of great things. I can't believe I'm not getting to see you since I'm out here on Fire Island till June 16th. But I hope to see you another time, Mary. And uh, Dr. Tachi is with us, uh, tuning in from Fort Lauderdale. Time for you to come up to New York, uh, Dr. Tachi, and be on the show with us, or I'll have to come down to see you. And uh, Patricia asks, uh, who would Jesse say is his most memorable mentor for his career in journalism? And before you answer that, I think you, you said something important, uh, that you wanted to be a cinematographer, and you may not have picked the right school or whatever, and you didn't end up in that career. And then you've had this fantastic other career. So what we want to do at 15, 17, 19, 20, even 30 may not be where we end up. And that's okay. A lot of kids today decide very early and stick to it. What do you think of that? Um, if you mean, you know, how we end up in a how we end or, up or choosing a different career you know, it's okay if you don't end up doing what you dreamt of at oh, 18. it's absolutely i mean um the the answer my comment on that and the answer to your question about uh my most important mentors will actually be somewhat intertwined uh coincidentally um i would say that the most important mentors in my life uh bar none in the journalism business, and I'm talking about in journalism, are actually my parents uh, who owned uh, a tiny small town newspaper in Southern Indiana uh, when I was a child and where um, I learned, I mean, they're my parents, I learned everything, but with respect to journalism specifically, um, I really learned how it's done. Um, they ran a... <coughs> really uh, serious small town newspaper. 
um, hard hitting stories, unpopular stories, which is particularly difficult to do in a tiny market like that because there are relatively few advertisers. Let's just face facts, right? Um, uh, so they ran this business and, um, uh, and as part of that, I was like, I covered, I covered school board meetings, I covered barn fires, I had the police scanner on my desk, which meant that if something happened, I had to grab the camera and run out and take a picture of it. Um, I covered high school sports, I worked in the press room, uh, and then at lunch and dinner, we would, uh, you know, I would get to hear mom and dad talk about their decisions and their, and the business, right? So they're far and away uh, the most important mentors. Uh, I learned the seriousness from them and the, and the fun and the humor and the joy, right? Yeah, that's, um, that's such a great story. And Abby told us about your parents and the papers, paper back then. Uh, so I suddenly remember that too. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, to the point about, um, it's okay. If you don't want to do the thing, you end up doing a thing that you didn't expect to do or didn't want to do when you're younger. I would just say that after all of that nice stuff that I just said about my parents, the last thing I wanted to do was work at a newspaper. The absolute <laughs> last thing I did not want to work in newspapers. I wanted to do other things. Um, I graduated out of college into a very bad market though. So I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't find the job, the kind of job that I wanted, but I did have newspaper <laughs> skills. And so I got a job in a newspaper and there was no turning back. That's how I ended up here today. Um, so I saw Maureen Pesta just uh, chimed in. Oh, you want to say hi? We go. That's mom. Hi, mom. <laughs> um, mom went to St. Mary's, the school you were mentioning just. Oh, uh, wow. She's, and, uh, she's watching yeah. on our website, Sri, yeah, and commented great. there. So I wanted to make sure yeah. we brought that in. Yeah, please uh, say hi, uh, Maureen. Uh, uh, thank you so much for watching. Tell all your friends that uh, your baby boy is on, on the air. And speaking of mothers, I just want to uh, give a shout out to Sudha Parik, um, Neil's mom, who is watching from Seattle. Uh, good morning to all the friends watching from Seattle. It's 6 a.m., Mama. Uh, hi, Auntie. <laughs> thank you for watching. Uh, uh, we really appreciate it. And thank you. Uh, for being here. Speaking of early morning, here is Diana watching from a campsite in East Eastman Lake, California. And she's uh, someone who's so interested in the environment, does a lot of work with the environment, and is raising little environmentalists, which is so nice to see. Uh, we ha And by the way, I've already got a guest book, thanks to you, Jesse. Uh, Dr. Tachi has said she would uh, join me on a future episode. So this is how we roll on this show. Uh, folks, that's Jesse Pesta, and we're talking to him about the New York Times climate section, as well as his career. And we're reading the Sunday New York Times. So please tell your friends. We do this every Sunday at 8.30 a.m. for eight years this November or so. We have to, I think August is our uh, anniversary. And uh, hundreds of perpetrators, let's just uh, zoom in here, hundreds of perpetrators and thousands of victims, a measure of accountability as 20 AGs report on Catholic Church sex abuse rollout. Uh, this is, you know, the scale of this is so stunning. And we were just mentioning Notre Dame, College of St. Mary's, these uh, big institutions. And we're seeing here, um, oh, as with Michigan State University, we also saw this at USC, that uh, big institutions have blind spots to their, uh, their problem areas often. And uh, we're seeing all this now. And this story, Jesse, uh, about problems with the church has been around, I think, 30 years now, right? Oh, and so I'm, I'm surprised about this. I'm, I, 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 missed, I didn't know about this and the fact that this is here like this in a big way. Uh, is uh, it just reminds us of the scope and pain. Yeah, I mean, that, that was my first reaction too. is, oh, oh my goodness, this, you know, we're still discovering tragedies like this. Just really, it's just really horrifying. Yeah, yeah we, have, uh, what, we have at least one doctor watching this morning and Sujana uh, made a point. She said hospitals and labs emit 4.4% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and produce more than 5 million tons of waste per year. How do individual doctors be the change we wish to see? So I don't know if you've covered that story of hospitals yet, Jesse, but uh, when you, if you haven't, uh, Dr. Ch Chandra Shaker is the person to talk to, clearly. But uh, this, is, this is, you know, 
how do we cover all of this stuff? How do you cover all of this stuff? I know it must be so difficult. Honoring the body, the body donors, and this is such an important story. I've never seen this before about talking about the cadavers, right? That uh, become a medical student's first patient. And uh, I'm speaking of, uh, uh, of um, uh, these kinds of medical issues. Uh, there's there's so much happening in the paper and, and just in the news about medical stories these days, and it's hard to sort out what's fact and what's fiction. And so that disinformation, misinformation problem is uh, certainly with us. Crackdown on cop city protests targets bail fu uh, bail fund. This is an Atlanta story, and uh, gaining mileage in complex reality for aging president. And this is about. Uh, uh, about uh, President Biden, Trump's lawyer notes notes Trump lawyers notes could be a key in classified documents inquiry. And the White House debt street ceiling strategy was to win in the fine print. And uh, I'm a big obituaries fan. We talk a lot about obituaries in this uh, in in our section. I mean, in our show, we've had Amy Padnani, who was an obituaries editor, and uh, created the Overlooked series, which you know. Uh, have you written many obituaries, and do you consume them, read them? Oh, I love to read them. I haven't written any, no. Um, uh, it, just to go back to Dr. Chandrasekhar's point, which I think is a really interesting question, because it's very specific to the medical, fee the medical field, right, which does produce a lot of uh, waste. Um, but it also is a little window into some of just the just climate challenge we are. Um, you know, one of one of and you know she can speak to this better than I, I'm sure. But one of the one of the great advances over the past 100 years uh, has been, of course, healthcare. And one of the reasons that it is um, has become so successful at defeating all kinds of bad things, bad diseases, is the uh, disposable nature of uh, a lot of the tools that are used, whether it's plastic gloves or any number of other things that can be disposed of, and you just eliminate that sterilization uh, problem because you can just throw the thing away when you're done with it. Um, on the other hand, that then becomes a, a climate issue because it's made from plastic and plastic is made from oil, and there you go, right? But uh, so the medical profession, interestingly, has this especially tricky problem to solve if it's going to address this kind of issue, because you can become less disposable. You can go back to using things that can get cleaned and reused, but that introduces other risks. And it also uses energy. A cl cleaning an object uses energy as well. Um, sterilizing objects uses energy as well. Um, okay, so that's all about hospitals and healthcare specifically, but just take that and expand it to all of society, right? Because the, it's, a, it's a, a particularly concentrated version of the pro problem that that we all, that any number of industries or each of us individually have in life, um, uh, you know, uh, regarding the sort of the disposability of just our culture and the way we live. So it's a really, it is a genuinely interesting question and a trickier one to solve than you might think at first glance too. Whoops, I think we've lost your audio. audio. Oh, I just turned off my audio because our dog was barking, sorry. We have two dogs here today. Uh, so here, I just wanna show show you that Neil is, we're gonna soon share some of your stories the, the, from the Climate Desk and look at uh, uh, the PDF versions of the story. And they're gonna be GIF links and PDFs to various climate stories on our website, digimentors.group. Folks can find it there and it's a nice, uh, extra benefit that we give to people who watch it on digimentors.group. Uh, just here, I'm going to go into this particular story because it's uh, so interesting. Cynthia, uh, we will. W there it is. Uh, you can find all all the features uh, shortly, and we'll discuss them. But here's a obit. Cynthia Weil, I presume, uh, whose uh, soaring lyrics made baby boomers feel, dies at 82. And I was thinking, well, I've not heard of her, but she and her husband. Uh, her husband's name is Barry Mann. Uh, they wrote uh, two, I mean, the only two songs mentioned at the very top are On Broadway and You've Lost That Loving Feeling. Huge songs, not just from the baby boomers, even, even for Gen Xers like me who love old music. And I'm going to take a second here and just read these lyrics from On Broadway. I'm not going to sing them, thank God. 
They say the neon lights are bright on Broadway. They say there's always magic in the air. But when you're walking down the street and you ain't had enough to eat, the glitter rubs all right off and you're nowhere. A uh, beautiful set of lines, important. Uh, look at uh, the great white way, as they say. And uh, so she was, writing, she was writing that uh, basically that's an autobiographical. No, this is a fantastic obit. I read it. I read it earlier. Um, and she wanted to she wanted to be on Broadway herself. So the, as the story explains, this was a little uh, autobiographical glimmer of her own hopes and dreams dashed that kind of thing. Really great story. And then, of course, you've lost that loving feeling. Such a big song. There were uh, and uh, and covered by many, many people as well. And then Don Bateman, who made a cockpit warning system and Kai Kaija Sariaho, 70 dies, trailblazing composer with an explorer's spirit. And uh, and then uh, just so much to read here. And then these are, of course, the daily obits. Sometimes I read through these because there are some gems in here. I mean, of course, everyone's life is important, but there are some beautiful little stories uh, in here as well. Uh, we're just going to glance at the sports section. What is your relationship with sports? Uh, fan, uh, enthusiast, uh, ignorer? I, I skew toward um, being a, somewhat of a sports dunce. Um, I'd say that's a fair, fair shorthand for my sports knowledge. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I grew up in a part of the country where there were basically no, uh, you know, there were no baseball teams anywhere nearby. There are no football teams anywhere nearby. I just, I just, I was in one of those um, uh, professional sports deserts, I guess. <laughs> and and uh, Notre Dame was the biggest sports story in the whole state, right? And and, yeah, and but, basketball, and of course, uh, and IU basketball. Yeah, yeah, of course. Sports. Yeah, uh, I'll I'll just say that Neil is a huge uh, sports fan and Yankees fan, and he's got already, I think, tickets to two games, even though he lives in D.C. Uh, in New York uh, in June. Hot, uh, hot Dodgers and Yankees are eager for what's next. And what is this? The court tennis. Inside the walls of court tennis, it's mostly about mind games. Look at this unusual uh, court. I've never seen this before. I'm reading a lot about pickleball, but uh, this is court tennis. The first time I'm uh, hearing of, of court tennis. And we should, since we talked so much about South Bend, how can we not mention that uh, uh, the former mayor of South Bend, Indiana, uh, the, such a small town, uh, ran for president and is now Transportation Secretary of the United States. An unlikely story. He's also one of the youngest uh, mayors, I guess. Though there are sometimes these small towns have 18-year-old mayors and, and things <laughs> like that. But he uh, was uh, mayor at a young age and after serving, and he was an Army reservist or a full Army, I can't remember that part, but Rhodes Scholar and everything else. And uh, so much transport, all, all this... Uh, all these stories about, uh, you know, su supply chain stories. A lot of them are transport stories as well. So here's a funny little, to go back to sports for a minute, here's a funny little Indiana sports story from my childhood. The Pacers, of course, are a basketball team in Indianapolis. When I was a kid, they were so not good that they would advertise on TV, you know, come, come watch the Pacers play, but they would be advertising the other team. So they'd advertise, they'd mention all the stars, all the big giant NBA stars who are going to be coming to town with the other team. And it just was, anyway, kind of a head scratcher. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the Parik, uh, the, the Dr. Parik says, some of the medical products are getting disposed to prevent infection. When I was growing up in India, injection syringes were sterilized in boiling water. Dr. Tachi says the obits are so interesting. And Naomi says, some are calling Broadway the great bright way instead. That's, you know, yeah. inclusive language. And Pradnya Haldipur is a great friend of the show, a former guest. Sorry to be late. Tuning in from Silver Spring, Maryland. Folks, that's Jesse Pesta. We're talking about the New York Times. We do this in other cities with other newspapers, and we're always looking for great guests. So if you'd like to be in Jesse's chair, uh, you don't have to live in Brooklyn like he does. We can bring you in remote from anywhere. Just message us. We'd love to have you as a guest. We are at, uh, we've got 40 minutes left with Jesse. We have a lot, lot of things to cover, including uh, all those great uh, uh, climate stories. So I'm going to just flip through the, uh, the front pages of the various sections. And Jesse, if you know any story in the section that you want to mention, you can. Otherwise, we'll zip through this. She's yeah. ready for her moment is Greta Lee 
uh, and her offbeat characters in Russian Doll, High Maintenance, and Girls. With past lives, she's winning raves for her restrained lead performance in what she calls, calls her soulmate film. I'm sorry, I don't know the actress Greta Lee. Uh, for those of us who are, who are joining us in progress, this was the front page, stunning, horrifying cover story, uh, cover image in the front page of the New York Times. The Metropolitan cover, heated debate over a highway. Building in the Interstate 81 viaduct in Syracuse ravaged a black neighborhood. Getting rid of the crumbling stretch stretch has proven has proved quite difficult. And that's an example of decisions that uh, affect, you know, neighborhoods and families and communities. In safe space, planting the seeds for an inclusive culture, a Staten Island garden project celebrates the gender fluidity of the natural world. I, I remember thinking the line in Jurassic Park about, uh, or the, the early Jurassic Park about the, the gender fluidity of some of the animals, uh, which land, landed up, you know, the, if you remember the story of Jurassic Park, that they were all females and they thought they would not have uncontrolled reproduction. What is that famous line from Jeff Goldblum? Life finds a way, right? Life, or life will find a way. Uh, here uh, is the just to, go, just to go back for a moment to the lead yeah. story on that, which I have not read, uh, and now I want to read it. I don't think I had spotted it yet. Anyway, there is a there is a climate element to the subject that this story, uh, uh, the topic that this story is addressing, which is the building of interstate highways that 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 you know sort of divide, bisect, and divide neighborhoods and cities. Um, and there is a, um, a a race element to it as well. There is um, the, the question of this kind of development uh, over in previous decades, creating essentially heat islands in cities. Some neighborhoods become a lot hotter than other neighborhoods because of lack of tree cover and, and too much pavement and so forth. This is something we've written about uh, a number of times on the climate desk. I'll be very interested to read this story too, which comes obviously from a different desk, but it's, uh, there's, a, there's a climate component to this kind of story for sure. No, absolutely. I was thinking the same thing. And look at what Pradnya is doing, tagging her friends. And then she's going over to LinkedIn to share this with her peers in climate and environmental justice. So folks do that. Go head over to LinkedIn. Just tag your friends there. They can watch this at their own uh, pace later. Here is Sunday Styles cover is what, when traditions meet trends. The work of Romanian potters is suddenly in demand. But will modern tastes alter centuries-old practices? These are, I haven't heard of Romanian pottery as something special, but more than 300 years, artisans in Horezu, Romania, have been making pottery. Not exactly pink yard flamingos. A Georgetown professor put up statues of transformers. Some locals didn't approve. And there's Bumblebee and Optimus Prime. In the real estate section, the cover is... The a little Spain in, is all but gone. The uncertain future looms for Our Lady of Guadalupe, once a seminal church. And uh, this is uh, in New York City. And a lot of us who read real estate expect it to be just about housing, but you can see here they have uh, stories like this as well. And the Sunday Magazine cover is the California issue. And I'm sorry we won't have enough time to get into it, but California is also ground zero for climate change. We know with the fires and the drought, and though it's been raining so much lately, hasn't it, Jesse, that they've somewhat uh, come out yeah. from the drought, maybe, perhaps, could be? Yeah, it's definitely provided some uh, much desperately needed uh, relief in terms of helping to uh, slow the damage. But it's, you know, it's, it's been so bad, it's not the kind of thing that fixes itself with just a rainy season. So, yeah. So, so what do what do uh, municipalities have to do to uh, keep the? It's about it's about collecting the water. Is that what it is? Um, so it it depends on many many things, including where where a city gets its water. Um, we uh, I'll use Phoenix as an example because Phoenix has been in the news this past week. Uh, Phoenix uh, has uh, gotten to the point where uh, it has decided that it doesn't have enough groundwater to support. Um, the construction of more new homes. So even homes that have been permitted and approved, now uh, uh, construction must uh, be halted uh, until Phoenix can figure out, you know, what it's going to do about this really fundamental problem. This just happened this week, um, a few days can ago. Can I just ask about that? What does that mean? That uh, And that's obviously a Republican state in many ways. Uh, 
is, is, was that a Republican administration that made those rulings or was that the Democratic city of Phoenix? Uh, can you, do, if, if you know. I, I believe it was the state uh, for reasons that aren't entirely clear to me. So I don't know exactly who uh, uh, made the official ruling, but nevertheless, it's a, it, is a, it is a practical decision. If you don't have enough water for people to, uh, you know, have water flowing out of their tap, in their new house, then there's, what are you going to do? Building the house makes no sense. So this is really an example of, you know, there's, there's a general perception that climate change will affect us severely in the future. This is an example, and there are many examples, but this is just one from this week of the reality of the climate change risk affecting people right now. Um, I mean, Phoenix, this is, an, this is remarkable for any number of reasons, including one of the main industries, for lack of a better word, in Phoenix is the building of houses. It's one of the yeah. fastest growing metropolitan area in the United States, I believe, or if not the fastest, certainly one of the fastest. So this is, this is a really fundamental economic reality affecting this place. So, uh, you know, what are they going to do? I don't think there's a good answer. This is a, it's, you know, it's a, it's a real problem. I'll, I'll just point out that Pradnya is there t tagging her friends. Everyone should do that. Mary C. Curtis says, and pollution and health component of that Syracuse bridge story is repeated all over the country. And that is that is so sad. I did want to uh, show you, I, I'm, I'm a person who loves California. I'm always cold in LA because I grew up thinking LA is like a David Lee Roth video and uh, you know everyone's in beach clothes and I'm always cold in LA because you you forget about the uh, the ocean and how cold it can get but I I, I posted this on uh, Instagram several years ago uh, I said that in another life I would have lived in the LA Sun and the LA moon you can see sort of the LA moon the very uh, tiny up up there and uh, so this is a shout out to California and all the people who live there who uh, have become kind of, uh, you know, the, the way that politics in this country works. A, a state of 29 million people has the same representation as Wyoming with its 500,000 people. And uh, so many issues in California are reflected all over the country and sometimes ahead of time, including all the fight for racial justice and police against police brutality. That all started in California, as we know, um, decades and decades ago, all the way back to the 60s, if not earlier. So shout out to California and lots of comments coming in and folks sharing. Please do, please tag your friends and tell them we've got another 30 minutes and we're going to show you some incredible climate coverage that Jesse's desk has done. And uh, we're going to go in in depth a little bit and uh, Pradnya says, in, if you permit a bit of self-promotion in the context of this topic, please check out the Institute for Sustainable Communities, where we work at the nexus of climate resilience and equity. Terrific. Thank you, Pradnya. I know that you uh, work on these issues, so it's really important. Uh, and thank you for sharing that. Last couple of things we're going to look at here is what is country? A dispute over a proposed discount store divides rural crossroads in Virginia. Oh, that's a really nice story. That's by Michael Corkery, who's a fantastic reporter. The, the this piece about yeah the dollar store, uh, yeah. very very nice nice feature. Yeah, I, we don't want to say what is country. I thought this was the music section, and they were going to talk about what is country music. And that's about yeah, a fight over a, it's <laughs> that story is about the fight over a dollar store in a very in a tiny community and what yeah. it means to have this dollar store at the at the main intersection. It's really nicely done. Sure. And Jeff Zucker just won't let CNN go already. His mo he's, he's moving on a year after his exit includes quite a bit of griping and uh, lots going on with CNN or even just in the last 24 hours with uh, shakeups and reorgs and all kinds of things. The Sunday opinion cover is what happens when there's when there's only one view on the view, like much of America, the influential talk show has tuned out real debate. Now, I don't watch the show, but I thought it always featured multiple voices. And I'm surprised that if, if it's true that it's doing that now, uh, I'm, I'm surprised to uh, hear that. And here's a, a, a very sad story. An epidemic of gang rape in India has women living in fear of being attacked, then blamed by Vidya Krishnan. And this is a moment where I want to 
show, if we can, Jesse's award-winning uh, story he did at the Wall Street Journal about uh, another aspect of the oh. dif very difficult lives that women live and lead in India. So if you can talk to us a little bit about it, and we'll, we'll bring it up. It's about how women intersect with fire. Yeah, yeah. So this is a piece that I reported, this is many years ago at this point, but just just a really astonishing story. There's the, there is the problem of uh, young women um, in family disputes in India will uh, sometimes be set on fire. Um, and there's a euphemism uh, for this, a kitchen fire. Um, and at some point, I, uh, uh, there, yeah, there's the piece that I wrote with Priti Garana. And, um, and I, at some point I decided I, I want to do a story about this and really understand uh, what's happening in a family where something like this occurs. Anyway, Pritika and I found a young woman, Parinita, she's there in the photo there, who had been set on fire. Um, and uh, she claimed that her family had set her on fire because she had two daughters and no sons. The family claimed that she had set herself on fire. This is in a rural, a very rural, you know, remote small town in Uttar Pradesh. Um, and so we then basically, uh, uh, Pritika and I, um, uh, um, set out to tell the story of her family. And uh, in the course of that, we discovered many astonishing things, including that about 20 years earlier, another young woman had been set, had been set a fire in the same house, the same man accused. Mm -hmm. So this story turned into really a reconstruction of a quarter century of these, these disastrous experiences in that the man on the screen there is the the brother of the woman who had been set alight earlier we found the family members we found all of the witnesses just and, and reconstructed the this family essentially epic right it's not the quite the right word some other word but this the story of this family's experience over 25 or so years wow and uh uh, you can give a shout out to your uh, partner, your reporting partner on that story. And Kritika is, uh, so that was the, uh, well, anyway, I, th that's the picture of the woman who was burned uh, in the earlier fire at on her wedding day, uh, being held by her brother. Kritika is just a phenomenal, she's a friend and a phenomenal reporter. Um, uh, I'm hoping she's watching uh, or tuning in this morning. I was texting with her earlier today. She's uh, at the Wall Street Journal. She covers tech now in San Francisco. Mm. Um, and um, it was it was really an experience. Uh, uh, anyway, there's a whole lot to be said about this story and our experience covering it, because we found ourselves really torn um, as we reported it about who to believe and why and what really happened. Keep in mind, we found every single witness to these events that, that you know, full stop and we more than more than anyone except perhaps members of the family themselves had this picture of what had occurred and we were really torn and sometimes within families they don't know the full story so it yeah. takes an outsider to come in and reveal secrets uh sometimes i i, I just love the layout of the screen right now we have abby your biggest fan <laughs> uh talking about what a powerful story this is and then uh, Saja, the organization that I co-founded, but was no longer on the board in 2016 when you and Pritika won this award uh, for this story. And uh, it, it makes me, uh, I, I'm smiling outwardly and inwardly. And Abby says, you took the photos for this tragic story as yeah. well. And she says, such powerful and personal reporting and storytelling. And Dr. Chachi says, wow, this story, I need to check it out. Uh, and what came of the story? Any action? Asked Dr. Tachi. Well, yeah, that's interesting. Um, the we had readers who uh, wanted to reach out and help, and so for one thing, the family uh, uh, received some some money from readers who were so moved by what had happened, and that helped with Parnita's care. Um, that was the main immediate outcome. Um, uh, I have stayed although now it has been a few years, but for a period of time, I was staying in touch with the family uh, through Facebook and elsewhere. 
I was thrilled recently to see a, a wedding photo. Uh, someone, someone in the family had gotten married and in the group photo of, of all the family members, 20 or so, you know, extended family members in a group photo, I saw Parnita, which I think is re in, in standing in this family f photo. And I think that is a remarkable, that's remarkably symbolic of something because you can see her injuries. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's, that's a statement and it, it made me happy to see. All right, last cover we're gonna look at before we get to your stories, Jesse. Book review, the summer reading edition. I'm on the beach, uh, though I'm working uh, the entire two weeks I'm here, including this morning, as you can see, the summer reading issue. So I'm gonna ask you, what are you looking forward to reading this summer? Oh gosh, um, haven't really <laughs> thought too much about that. Um, I have I have the endless stack of books that I never quite get to the bottom of. I wouldn't say anything. I don't have anything in particular. I hate to ha I hate to be that. Um, I hate to punt on that, but I'm going to have to. That's okay. And uh, look, just uh, this is this is a extra thick section. Uh, I think it's like 55, 56 pages of book book stuff. So. Uh, folks, you can, uh, I think they still sell the book review separately at places like Barnes & Noble. I can't remember if they do, but uh, the print edition, they, they used to at least sell them separately. So I think now I'm going to, uh, before I bring Neil in, I just want to point out uh, that there's a presidential candidate running for office uh, on the Republican side, and uh, there are more than one who are climate deniers, climate change deniers, and, and, and uh, folks who uh, think that... Uh, there isn't a problem with the climate change. So I wanted to uh, show you one of those uh, uh, folks. Uh, this is a guy named uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, who is not going to be president or even uh, uh, the nominee, but he reflects some of the thinking uh, that is now mainstream Republican uh, talking points, right? And electrical, electric vehicle subsidies, stop measuring CO2 emissions, drill, frack, burn coal, uh, burn coal. The climate emperor has no clothes. And then here are some uh, nice comments. Uh, Dan Kennedy says, I enjoyed the New York article in which you talked about losing all your friends. And my favorite is very much looking forward to you never being president by Benjamin Dreyer. So the question for you really is to address that for people who are saying we don't have an emergency. In fact, we're not drilling enough. And we've heard this, not just from him, uh, but Sarah Palin, you remember uh, all those years ago uh, in the 2008 election, et cetera. So what will it take to get everyone to understand the true emergency in front of us? Um, you know, it's one interesting thing about this is that um, as um, some of the land and over the past X number of years as some of the denier, you know, denier language became more vociferous and strident. Uh, there, uh, it has kind of had the opposite effect. There was a more widespread acceptance of the fact, the reality of climate change, human caused climate change. I mean, the numbers show that. Um, so you could, you could surmise that some of this kind of talk actually had an, the opposite effect. It focused, uh, it focused some uh, more more Americans attention on what you know what is actually true and real so I mean you know I don't know I don't know what to say about uh, our presidential candidate there uh, aside from climate change is real the science the science is uh, is undisputed essentially there's no there's there's no real question um, uh, of the fact of climate change and the fact that it is human caused that we're putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and it warms the atmosphere. It's just, yeah. I mean, what can it, yeah, I'm not going to say, I mean, I don't know what you could say here. Pratnia says, I would love to hear Jesse's thoughts on the conservative climate caucus. I didn't know there was such a thing. Yeah. I'm not sure what, uh, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with the organization, but, um, yeah. Okay, if there's a story in the future about the climate con uh, conservative climate caucus, you'll know that Jesse heard about it here first. Uh, <laughs> let's. Uh, I, I want to. We, we have. I would go back one time. just one second. One uh, because I I there is a book that I read. Back to the book question um, that I found su surprisingly entertaining. I just finished it a week or two ago. 
uh, um, and I unfortunately I don't remember the name of it, but it's Dan Egan's book on, on of all things, Phosphorus. And it is absolutely fascinating. It is a super quick read. And it is, there's a, there's a climate element to this, an environment element to this, the importance of this thing that you just never think about in making a total The Devil's mess. Element is the name of the book. The Devil's, yes, Devil's the Element, Devil's Phosphorus and a World Out of Balance. And Dan's a great environmental reporter and writer, and uh, I'm a fan of his, so I'm so he glad you phenomenal. And, and it, the book is, not only is it a fast read, but again and again, you just find, I found myself, found myself saying, what? <laughs> what yeah. he's he's a, it's really something and now i want to uh, bring neil in so that he can walk us through this um, this great collection the two of you have put together of uh digital le leading uh environmental coverage and then he's going to show us the pdfs and all the pdfs are on digimentors.group so the next 20 minutes as we wrap up are going to be focused on that so neil over to you thank you sri appreciate it and uh, again jesse thank you for for joining us Absolutely uh, fascinating discussion. Let's take a look at, um, so one of the things that we, we want to mention to folks, uh, although we focus on the print edition of the Sunday Times, our show is really a love letter to print and, and the New York Times in general, the Climate Desk uh, is digital first, right? You put your yeah. stories together, you put your packages together with an eye toward how can you make it really shine online? Yeah. Um, so I want to walk through a couple of stories. We're going to uh, show a, a story online uh, and then show how, how it came out in print and, and talk about it a little bit. And uh, we'll see how many of these we can work through, uh, giving them uh, enough time. I remember when this story came out the, um, about the methane uh, leaks. Uh, we saw, I remember we, we did a show that week. So I'm going to scroll through and you'll see the, the animation. Feel free to just... Uh, talk to us while we're going sure. through. Yeah, so this was an investigative piece that we did a few years ago. Methane is an, a very potent greenhouse gas. And um, one of the problems is that it leaks from facilities all over the place, but you can't really see it, right? It's literally invisible. So we had, um, uh, we decided that we wanted to try to show uh, this problem in a visual way. And we um, we used this really unusual technology, a special camera that can obviously photograph this invisible um, gas. Um, it's just the technology is a little bit mind boggling. The camera has to be cooled, as I recall, to a very low temperature before it can do its thing. Um, we had to send Jonah, Jonah Kessel, uh, who's one of the bylines on this piece, had to go and learn. It took weeks and weeks simply to learn how to operate the camera. Um, it was it was quite um, you know it was it was quite the technological achievement to kind of make all of this happen. So then we found all kinds of leaks and obviously showed them uh, and reported them out uh, here for the story. Sure. And then this is uh, the rest of the story. A uh, little bit more of the infrared camera showing how the gas, the methane, is escaping. Um, and you can really see how, you know, when you, when you look at this online, I mean, it's just striking, right? Yeah, this um, is, um, this is a team of two reporters, uh, Hiroko Tabuchi, who's the, um, a, an investigative reporter who I work a lot with, um, did the, you know, did the reporting and the digging. Um, Jonah, who was a, uh, he's, uh, he now has a different job at the time. He was one of our, um, sort of, uh, video photography tech geniuses who helped, uh, make this, uh, video presentation happen, um, and learned how to operate the camera. And of course also was participating in the reporting. Um, a fantastic team, fantastic team. So as we get to the bottom of the uh, story, you see the great uh, graphics with the map and, you know, uh, more more examples of the um, of the, uh, the methane escaping. Now, let's take a look at uh, what it looks like online. Uh, so we're going to switch gears a little bit and I'm going to turn um, turn here. I'll make this a little bit bigger for for folks. So this is on the front page. Um, you can see it was below the fold. 
uh, had a nice, you know, kind of center graphic in terms of that that striking uh, um, escape of methane. Uh, but then inside, um, this is what we uh, get to. So let's take a look at this uh, two-page spread um, showing the side-by-side -side pictures. So that was a really great way of showing that that same what we saw online um, that show that difference. Um, and that's yeah, a good, good bit of real estate for this. Yeah. And this is a especially tricky one to translate from, you know, a, you know, from video, a video presentation online to a, a traditional print presentation. But we have these designers who are just who are so good at this kind of thing. And I'm just reminded, just looking at this, uh, another interesting difference uh, between the online and the um, uh, print presentation is that this is a case where the story has a different byline uh, online versus. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, so because um, Jonah's role was so prominent yeah. in, you know, in the online version. Uh, and then so you can see the two. Anyway, it's it's Heroku. Heroku. Yeah. Got Heroku the on here. Yeah. Got the uh, byline there. And just yeah. a reminder of, to folks that you can get the gift link for the um, the article online article and the PDF. We have the PDF courtesy of The New York Times. Our friend Wayne Camadoy, who was a guest uh, last uh, December. Uh, Wayne and Jesse uh, you know, both sent PDFs, and, and we we're able to put these uh, together for you. Um, but note uh, one thing that I learned this week in terms of gift links, they are only uh, good for two weeks. Uh, they expire. Uh, so if you are interested in checking out any of the gift links we have on our website, make sure you uh, uh, check them out uh, before they go away. Um, so let's take a, a look at another article, um, and this is um, the. Um, I'll bring this up uh, now. This is the um, South Asian monsoon article that you uh, were a part of uh, mm -hmm. as an editor. Um, so it must have been fun to come back, uh, you know, do some some South Asian work uh, with this. So let's take a look at the online version and, and walk us through. Tell us what's what we're looking at. Yeah, so this um, is a sort of a data extravaganza. The, we're looking at uh, uh, representations of rainfall in the region and how it is changing and becoming more severe uh, as the and erratic as the monsoon uh, changes due to you know, due to the climate change. Um, this was very difficult to. Uh, it was very, it was very difficult for us to figure out a way to present this in a in a clear fashion. Um, it's a lot of a lot of trial and error here before we came up with this uh, presentation uh, at the top of the story. Anyway, the this was just a fantastic piece by Henry Fountain, um, one just a great science reporter. He just this in fact was sort of his swan song. He retired uh, shortly after this was published. Um, but again, data extravaganza, looking at and ways to visualize. These aren't illustrations. These are actual presentations, visual presentations of actual data uh, uh, showing wind patterns, rainfall, and so forth. Uh, it, takes a, it takes a special kind of designer to be able to do, to do this kind of work. Absolutely, absolutely. It's just great. You can see, you scroll through, see how the patterns change and the flow. Um, and how long does it take to put a, a piece like this together? Um, well, it sort of depends. Um, you know, this, I, and I don't remember exactly in the case of this story, but um, for one thing, Henry had to travel travel there. That alone took some time. Um, the data work can be uh, quite complex. You first have to figure out what kind of data is available. Uh, then what can, can it show the things that we want to be illustrating? And then you have to design, for instance, this kind of, you know, continental scale presentation of of this kind of data. So it can take some time. I'd We're say talking this, several months. Uh, yeah, this more than a, a year. In a few months, I would say. I just don't remember specifically, yeah. but definitely no, just several. in general, like even the methane story, like just trying to get a scale. This yeah. isn't something you put together in a week or two. No, absolutely not. Methane also took several months uh, from deciding how we were going to do it to 
get, you know, getting Jonah trained up to then going to these places and seeing what we would see. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see and, and, and lots of room for great pictures, embedded video, uh, uh, a Mumbai street scene. Um, Sri and I were in India in uh, March and I t brought back some video like that as well. It's a, uh, this is great. Um, just great, great work. Uh, and did your your previous work with the Wall Street Journal uh, come into play here at all in terms of covering South Asia? Um, so I was, you know, uh, I helped edit and I worked on this piece. Uh, yeah. So I'm very familiar with it. Um, you know, it helps a little bit to uh, know, uh, have a sense of, I mean, I've spent a lot of time there, obviously, and Henry had spent less time. So I was able to talk about some of the things, places he might go, things he might see. Uh, during monsoon season and how it varies so much around the country. Uh, the Mumbai experience of the monsoon is different from the, you know, the Goa experience is different from the Delhi experience and so forth. So we, you know, I was able to maybe just help think about, think about that sort of question, where to go to sort of demonstrate the variety. So, yeah, Great. it doesn't, it doesn't hurt. Yeah. No, I'm sure. I'm sure it came in came in handy. Uh, Want to pull in uh, a comment that um, uh, Linda Lawrence put in? Uh, New York Times creates the best data visualization anywhere. Masters. Uh, so that's definitely uh, high praise and and well deserved uh, praise. And well, thank we'll, you very uh, much, Linda. Pull this back up. Uh, I, I think my favorite from this was this uh, this piece in the middle uh, mm -hmm. showing the um, uh, the currents. Uh, definitely, uh, definitely interesting. Um, and then let's see. Uh, and then uh, people are, are sharing again. Uh, Ron Thomas says, great discussion as always. Thank you, Ron. Always uh, appreciate it. So let's, uh, as we did uh, before, let's uh, turn our attention to the uh, PDF and see what that looked like um, in the, uh, again, kind of as a, a small picture on the front. Uh, if you look down, there's uh, just the one picture, nourishing life and threatening it. Uh, South Asia's monsoon growing more violent and erratic because of climate change. Um, and then when you take a step back and look at the, the coverage, uh, I thought it was really interesting the way they did um, the, uh, the piece because they, they put it on two pages inside. Um, and it's actually it's coming up. The third page is is the the flip over. So I apologize. I apologize for that. But you see the two pages back to back, side by side rather, in terms of the the blue and the red, uh, to show how it's uh, getting more extreme and how it's getting harder to predict. Uh, yeah, the idea there is that the red, if if I recall recall correctly, the red shows places where the rainfall be, has is becoming more extreme. Yeah. Um, it, where it's harder, the red is where it's harder to predict and more deadly. Yeah, they're uh, erratic and extreme is the is the yeah combination, right? Yeah, um, so definitely uh, interesting, and uh, um, so we will take a look at that, uh, and then um, let's see. So the next story we want to take a look at uh, is um, uh, on uh, San Francisco, uh, and um, that this was another. Uh, great uh piece um so let's bring that up real quick um and uh just take one moment to make the uh transition there we go so this is a piece that was written by another former guest uh mm -hmm. john branch uh was a guest on the show and um he uh you know, we, we definitely enjoyed having him. So let's take a look at this real quick. Um, what's going on here? What's going on in San Francisco? So um, the uh, basically this defining feature of San Francisco fog is uh, changing in various ways because of climate change. And that has various consequences. Um, but uh, that reach far beyond just the simple fact that we think of, you know, San Francisco as being a foggy city. Uh, it has uh, ramifications for the health of redwood forests, which rely on fog for, uh, uh, for their water. 
Uh, and um, so we, anyway, we did this really, and John is just such a fantastic writer and reporter. Um, he came to, a, he, he's not on our desk. He's doesn't, he's, he's sports. You know, he works sports. Yeah. yeah. But he, we consider him just a great friend of climate. Uh, and every once in a while, several times now, he's come to us and said, I have this idea for a story. Let's, let's try to do this. And so he came to us with this and, you know, obviously we we're very excited about it. And the, the notion was to show the wide ranging effects of this change uh, uh, in fog, a thing that defines the certain, the certain city, the certain part of the world, um, but to tell the story from many different perspectives. So he went out on people who uh, work on ships and, and uh, talked about what they were seeing. Um, he talked to real estate agents about how the fog has literally defined neighborhoods uh, around the city. He talked to experts. He found experts who are essentially fog catchers. They go up into the hills and try to design ways to actually capture fog and, and, you know, and capture the water. He talked to uh, experts on the redwoods. Just, just a really surprise. He talked to the folks who uh, work on the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, which of course gets totally, uh, you know, in, encased in fog, um, and w what their experience has been and how their experience is changing. Just a beautiful story. Nina Reggio did the photography; just absolutely wonderful photography. And again, we have this kind of data presentation project going on. These, as before, these are not illustrations; these are based on scientific data. Yeah, it can be it can be very tricky to. Uh, convert into a compelling visual form. And, and these are all, you know, again, digital first for the climate desk. Yeah. Uh, lots of room for photos, uh, these huge shots, um, which is yeah. just phenomenal. What was the biggest uh, uh, shift for you? I mean, having worked with the Wall Street Journal, you worked on the business desk before joining climate, right? On the yeah. Sunday business. Yeah. Um, so up till that point, I'm assuming, I mean, I'm, here's the question. Had you worked in a digital first environment before? And if you hadn't, what was that transition like for you? Yeah, and not, not like this, not like what we do here on climate. Um, by the way, just to go back, I would mention yeah. that Scott Reinhardt is, um, is the visual genius behind the uh, data presentations in this piece. He's just, he, was just mad, he was just great, so great to work with. Absolutely. Um, and that kind of is, uh, and so a shout out to Scott, but that kind of is a segue into it, the actual answer to your question is one of the differences here on the climate desk is that we have um, a, you know, a staff. We're not a big staff, but we do have a staff of people who have this kind of expertise. And that's part of how you make a digital, a digital first uh, presentation like this work. You need the people with this varied expertise, journalists, journalists first but who have the expertise that Scott brings, for instance, to be able to interpret and visualize and present some of this data that we've then reported. So, I mean, that's really, that's really the difference. Um, you, you have people who you can work with who can help make a project like this happen. And, and Abigail uh, was saying, thank you for sharing these fantastic stories. Couldn't agree more. I've got, um, I've got, a, I'm gonna, I've got to buy my sister a beer. <laughs> and uh, such great visuals as well. Um, which I think is a, is a great um, segue, actually, to the print um, uh, treatment for this story. Because if you look at the full front page, they use that same photo, uh, this one of the bridge in the fog, right? They put, the, uh, put that on the front page. Uh, so we'll take a look at that um, a little bit bigger on the screen. Um, so a little bit more uh, real estate for this uh, uh, piece. Uh, San Francisco without the fog. Some scientists say it's waning uh, with uh, John Branch's byline. Uh, and then when we uh, uh, take a look at the inside pages, um, we see this beautiful, beautiful treatment. Um, let me just try and get the uh, uh, sizing right. So this, you, again, you see the two pages side by side uh, with the huge picture of the fog in the middle um, uh, three pages total inside, but then you also have um, some of that data visualization 
uh, on that page three. Um, and we'll see whether we can show that to you a little bit more clean, cleanly. Uh, apologize for the uh, formatting. Um, we'll go to single page. Uh, that's what it should have been, sorry. So here is, uh, here is where you saw the uh, data visualization come up in the print edition. Uh, they chose four, four of those shots to try and tell the story. Um, which is really interesting. And then a lot of, uh, again, a lot of good, good real estate. Um, I think it, to me, this is just a, a testament to how great the story is that you're getting three full pages to, to tell it in print. Um, granted, you can't really do it the same justice, but, uh, you know, they, um, yeah, it's a different, it's space. A different, yeah, it's a different art entirely. Um, and again, we're lucky we have such great designers who can take this thing that was designed for a, a, a moving, moving that is to say that is actually the images are, move, are moving around, mm -hmm. <laughs> this moving presentation and make it uh, so, you know, so striking in print. And I didn't, I didn't check the, um, uh, the date line, the, the, the publication date on the article, but I know that in general, uh, working with the the Times, working with Tom Jolly and, and Wayne Camadoy, print and online don't necessarily have to be in sync. Uh, they When something's ready to go online, they put it online. And then when it's ready for print, they'll put it in print or vice vice versa. Um, right. Usually, you know, it, it may be around the same time, maybe within the same week. I know with the uh, book review anniversary, there was a really great piece about haunts of writers that mm was uh, online in time for the anniversary in October. Uh, we had Tina Jordan as our guest, the deputy editor of the book review, but the print version didn't come out for like eight months later. Um, it just, wow. it was an evergreen story and that that was just the right time to put it up. Um, Gosh, I didn't realize uh, they would wait that long, but <laughs> yeah, like this, I don't remember exactly when this story was published online versus print, but it was probably within a week or so. Oh, good. Uh, good. Usually, uh, usually a few days, but it, it, it just, it just, it depends on many things um, that, you know, it depends on the news. It depends on whether there is uh, color available for that middle spread of the paper. Right. Absolutely. Um, so that's, that's kind that's of a big a, issue. Yeah, technical production pro uh, question, but that will have a, an, that can sometimes affect the decision. Just fundamental stuff like that. Absolutely. Um, the so we're at just just after ten o'clock. Uh, we have one more article we were going to share. If you okay. have a few minutes, Jesse, if you do have to sure. run, we certainly yeah. want to respect that. Uh, it's I'll... the um... sorry, you were saying. Oh, all good. All good. All good. Yeah. All good. Great. Because it's that article uh, on the uh, uh, Atlantic uh, Ocean um, mm. and uh, how, um, you know, in the Atlantic Ocean, subtle shifts hint at dramatic dangers, uh, which is another phenomenal um, data visualization piece. If you scroll through, uh, you know, Gulfstream has shaped climate and history on four continents. Uh, just seeing the way that uh, your team put this together. Um, yeah, this was... This would be Jeremy White, who would be the genius behind this presentation. And again, this is uh, based on real, actual data. This is not an, an artist's conception. It is not an illustration. It is, it is the data, the, the actual facts of how these currents flow on planet Earth. So this was a visualization, essentially, of half the planet. Yeah. Um, so that's a lot of data. I mean, that's a lot to, to make work. Yeah, uh, and Jeremy uh, Jeremy White is the guy who who uh, did this. He, not only did he literally make uh, you know adapt the data to uh, this kind of application, but then he designed it as well. He has a wonderful eye. Just fascinating, and then some nice video as well. Yeah, so uh, this was yeah, this is um, uh, again we had this undersea data that we were really. I mean, we were struggling. It was fascinating data. But we were struggling to figure out how to present it. Again, Jeremy made this happen. We so this goes from video, right? This is video up top, or I'm assuming that I think that I think that is an animated sea surface. I don't animated. Think that, okay. Yeah, but in any case, yeah, we're now above the surface of the sea, and, and here we go beneath the surface and go down a few hundred feet at a time 
to discuss how deep sea currents move and change and flow around the world. Again, based on real data, this is not a, an artist interpretation or a visualization. Yeah, just, just fascinating, fascinating stuff. Um, I always like seeing, you know, what the New York Times does uh, online. Um, and we, we try and celebrate uh, both, but this has definitely been a deeper dive into the uh, data visualization work that uh, y'all are doing. Do other desks uh, get do as much work with this? Uh, I mean, I know New York Times graphics and such are busy, but who are, what yeah. are some of the other desks that do this kind of work? Oh, uh, you know, we're not the only ones doing this kind of thing. It takes different forms, on di very different forms on different desks. There's the visual invest investigations team that does that f just absolutely mind-bending work around uh, based on, you know, f finding social media videos and mm -hmm. other data points and audio recordings and whatnot and piecing all of the pieces together. We've done, uh, the Times has done just really interesting uh, reconstructions of, for instance, building collapses. I'm sure you remember some of these. Sure. And, um, uh, and uh, or or specific events uh, where we can, you know, in history where we reconstruct a neighborhood or a community in three dimensions and show what you know, now versus then or what happened or how did this disaster unfold. So yeah, all kinds of stuff. Someday I hope I get to work on some of that. So. So this last PDF that we're going to show uh, got the most real estate. Uh, was a display story that that day. Uh, March 13th is when it came out. Uh, and then when you looked at the um, uh, inside pages, uh, you'll see, again, this uh, just great, I mean, great visual. I think this is one of the best uh, print treatments that we've seen of the four. Uh, you can, we can zoom in on this a little bit just to show how they, they took the work you did online and, and put it into print. Uh, with that graphic and then good text uh, below. Um, so uh, again, Jesse, thank you very much for uh, walking us through this. Uh, absolutely uh, brilliant. Uh, and uh, as a, um, before we uh, let you go and, and let folks go, um, we had had a question at the very beginning. I think Sri had um, asked about the photographs on your wall. Uh, oh, and yes. um, Abigail was kind enough to answer that question for us um, right away, That uh, asking about the uh, photographs. Uh, she <laughs> said that those are from Starve Hollow Road, uh, the website uh, that you have for your photography. So uh, we would be uh, remiss if we did not share your website as well um, for folks to enjoy um, the view so to speak. Oh, yeah. Well, thank right. you very much for that. Um, the, I, I do absolutely love photography and um, in a different world, I, my dream is to be a photographer. So there you go. <laughs> what is the name of that website? Starve Hollow Road. What does that mean? Yeah, yeah. so Starve Hollow is a real place. That's where I grew up in, in Indiana. Um, it's, it's not some kind of made up kind of ironic name. It is, you know, if you look on the old historic maps, you know, the old plat maps going back into the 1800s, you know, it's, there it is, starved, starved holler. Um, and so that's this little very rural place where I grew up. Yeah. Yeah. And for those of you who missed it, he talked about earlier how uh, he worked with his parents on the small town paper uh, in that part of Indiana. Yeah. Pradnya says this was fantastic. And we also found the website for the, uh, for her, uh, uh, organization that she works for. Uh, so everyone should check out uh, so such an important, everybody who's doing any kind of work in sustainability, uh, we salute you. And we're very grateful for all of you who are doing doing that kind of work. So it's really, really important. And her website is sustain.org, Pradnyas. And Dr. Tachi says, uh, these are phenomenal photos, and this was a fantastic session. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Tachi, and uh, looking forward to having you as a guest on this show. And uh, Abby, at this point, is now reduced to just emojis because she's run out of all the words <laughs> are now done. And I've, I noticed this when she was on our show that rarely do brothers and sisters uh, show this much public support for each other. I have boy, girl, <laughs> twins, so I have a taste of the uh, dynamic of brothers and sisters, but this is really special. Jonathan says, great show. Thank you. 
and uh, we're again putting out the link. It's starvehollowroad.com. Do you sell any prints and stuff, Jesse? Oh, sometimes, yeah. I mean, I've been, yeah, uh, I've been in some shows here and there and that kind nice. of thing. So every once in a while, nice. That so, really happens. <laughs> yeah. Very good, and uh, and then there's the ultimate compliment when. Uh, uh, Neil's mom, uh, Dr. Parikh, uh, great show, very important issue. And uh, Abby says, we guys are the greatest. Uh, that's incredible. Uh, thank you. <laughs> right again. Go ahead. Abby is right again. <laughs> but thank you very much. Uh, I also want to remind everyone that last week we had also a terrific episode with uh, Jesse's colleague, uh, Shriya Sinha, who mm -hmm. is the New York Times editorial director for New York Times Audio, and they just launched the audio app uh, two weeks ago. We had her on three days later, and I've been listening so much great content. And unlike the Times, which uh, is kind of a walled garden in many ways, they do such a good job of including other publishers. And so you can listen to uh, sounds and stories and things from Rolling Stone and Nat Geo and all kinds of great stuff. I, I forget the exact mix, but This American Life. Uh, so definitely check out the audio app, NYT Audio. Most people haven't heard about it yet uh, when I'm telling them that's the first time some people are hearing about it. So there's a lot going on. It's the first New York Times app in, I think she said seven years, Neil. I can't yeah. remember, seven or nine oh, yeah. years, something like that, which is, of course, a landmark uh, event. And Ron Thomas says is a great learning experience always. This means so much to us. Uh, after this, Neil and I have to go off and work on our newsletter, my uh, Sunday note, uh, where we look at tech, life, and the intersection of both. And uh, we are talking this week about teens and social media. And uh, and Neil has a preteen, and so I know he'll be reading that newsletter very carefully. But uh, if you are not a subscriber, please uh, do subscribe. It's free at threenet.substack.com, threenet.substack.com. And I know the New York Times, Jesse, does so many newsletters, right? There was a while where I think they had 50, and basically they'd take two people, put them on a newsletter, see how it goes for however many months, and then either sunset it or expand it. And that was a fascinating way of uh, looking at and doing newsletters. So everyone should uh, check out the New York Times collection. And just a reminder that this is not only about the New York Times, it's about journalism and our love of print journalism in particular, but it's evolving nature as well. If you are in any city and would like to read your local paper with us, let us know. And if you'd like to sponsor us, uh, please write to me, Sri at digimentors.group or at Sri on Twitter. My DMs are always open. Or Neil Parekh, Neil at digimentors.group. And he's at Neil Parekh. And with that, we're going to wrap up the show. Neil has one more before, announcement. Before you do, I want to just make sure to remind people that if you joined us late uh, and we had someone who just uh, asked the very question, Andrea, um, if you joined us late, as soon as the show is done, you can find it on the same links on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, YouTube, and our Digimentors website. You can watch it from the very beginning. So, uh, uh, and, this, and this time we have a very special uh, thing that uh, Jesse and Neil have done. They have taken the digital first articles uh, about of uh, their uh, of the climate, some four digital stories and also shown you the PDFs and seen the evolution. So this should be in journalism school. They should be taking those four stories. There are gift links to those stories. So as you know, the New York Times has a leaky wall and the PDFs are there as well. So that's on digimentors.group and uh, definitely check that out. Otherwise, Two weeks. Are, yeah. Two weeks for the gift links. They expire. Yeah. So, so get them. Get make sure them. you check them out. And, and Mary's uh, uh, talking about teens and social media on her podcast. So I will put that link in. Uh, Mary, thank you for uh, alerting me to that. And Andrea says thank you as well. And you're a great journalist herself. With that, we're going to wrap up. Thank you very much, Jesse, for staying with us for all these all this time. And thank you, everybody around the world, for watching. We're so grateful and lucky and blessed to have you as part of the New York Times Read Along community. And we'll see you next week. Thank you very much. Sunday's 8.30. Bye-bye.